talk to you? Sure, I know all about it. Actually, more than I need to. Since my old moniker, Fort Hardy, climbed to 10,000 feet, I posture the least of my worries. I'm flying from Weatherford, Oklahoma to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I see on the map here I'm going to have to climb to 12,000 to clear the Sandia mountain range. There's a real problem in mountain flying. And where I'm from, I don't ever use oxygen. And since I only be up there about 30 minutes, I really don't think I'll need it on this flight. You know, I suppose pilots who smoke and drink do have to worry about hypoxia, but I don't smoke or drink and I work out regularly, so I don't feel I have to worry about it. These are pretty typical comments every time the subject of hypoxia comes up. It always seems to be something the other man should be concerned about. Point of fact, no matter what you fly, or where you live, or how good shape you're in, hypoxia is a part of your real world. The three pilots who've given us their ideas on hypoxia are typical of those who rarely consider lack of oxygen as a deterrent to fly. Even though it can rob them of their reflexes, their reason, and even their consciousness. But an awareness of what causes hypoxia and how it can be recognized in time to prevent problems can be learned. It's not a difficult subject, but frankly, it is more complicated than most pilots realize. The dictionary defines hypoxia as a deficiency of oxygen reaching the tissues of the body. But in order to really appreciate that definition, let's look at the breathing process. It's a common misconception that when you take a breath, you suck in a volume of air. Actually, the act of inhaling merely creates an area of low pressure in the lungs, which permits oxygen and other gases to enter by means of their own ambient pressure. At sea level, the atmosphere contains about 21% oxygen. At 18,000 feet, or even 40,000, the atmosphere still contains about 21% oxygen. But because of the decrease in pressure, as you go higher in altitude, the molecules of oxygen, as well as the other gases, are further apart. Hence, each breath you take will not only contain fewer molecules of available oxygen, but there's less pressure to assist in the transfer of oxygen from the lungs to the red blood cells. Scientifically, it has to do with atmospheric pressure. As you'll remember, standard sea level pressure is 29.92 inches of mercury, or 760 millimeters of mercury. Since about one-fifth of the atmosphere is oxygen, the sea level oxygen pressure is 159 millimeters of mercury. As we ascend, pressure decreases. At 18,000 feet, atmospheric pressure is about 15 inches, or 380 millimeters of mercury. In other words, only about half that available at sea level. Yet the capacity and oxygen need of your lungs remains constant, and just breathing faster or deeper won't compensate. The of atmospheric pressure brings on the classic form of hypoxia, the type most of us think of when we hear the word. But having oxygen available in the lungs is only part of the story. Let's follow oxygen into the tissues and see how other hypoxia-producing mechanisms work. Oxygen in your lungs combines with hemoglobin in the blood and is fed by the red blood cells to the capillaries, tissue, and organs of the body. Carbon monoxide, however, will also combine with hemoglobin. And unfortunately, the affinity of hemoglobin for carbon monoxide is 200 times greater than its affinity for oxygen. Thus, carbon monoxide will displace oxygen in the hemoglobin. The result is an impairment of oxygen delivery to the tissues. The normal level of carboxyhemoglobin in the bloodstream is less than 1%. People living or working in any major city can frequently be exposed to carbon monoxide concentrations that will increase their blood levels to 10 times that amount. In addition, people who smoke who are exposed to certain environments or to adverse atmospheric conditions will find their carbon monoxide concentrations 
can be significantly higher. And a level of only 10% in the blood may result in a 20% decrease in the amount of oxygen delivered to the tissues, which can severely degrade heart and brain function. To safely demonstrate the effects of hypoxia on both mental and manual dexterity, an altitude chamber is utilized. Our subject has been instructed to match the colored nuts to the background and to repeat the task rapidly. Without oxygen at 30,000 feet, our subject begins quickly enough. But after a few minutes, the deterioration in his performance becomes obvious. The change in his facial coloring is another symptom of hypoxia. Though these effects are rapid and dramatic, only a longer exposure time is needed for the same degradation of skills to occur at much lower altitudes. At any altitude, the danger of hypoxia is the fact the subject is not aware of its failing ability. So although your altimeter will tell you your actual altitude, remember it can't give you your personal altitude, which may vary from a few hundred to several thousand feet. To emphasize this point, we've placed our non-smoking pilot in an altitude chamber in simulated flight at 18,000 feet. 437 Bravo, stop. Squawk 4500, although reaching altitude. 427 Bravo, Roger. We thus approximate the physiological altitude of a heavy smoker, exposed to the hazards of present-day urban environment, flying at 11.5 well below the 12,500 where oxygen is required for flights over 30 minutes. 27 Bravo, radar contact, continue heading 260. 427 Bravo, roger, turning to 260. Roger. Our subject has been at altitude for under half an hour. But already his expression has changed from relaxed to one of studied concentration. Though he began his task in full control, the insidious effects of flying at altitude without supplemental oxygen will become readily apparent. 27 Bravo, um, no contact. One of the first noticeable changes will be in the quality of the speech. 27 Bravo, for vectors around traffic, turn left, heading 210. 427 Bravo, 210. Notice, too, the changes in facial coloring. His lips are turning darker because of oxygen deficiency. After about one hour aloft, our subject misses a transponder code change and must ask for it again. 27 Bravo, swap code 3320. 27 Bravo, say again, code uh, swap. Code 3320, 3320. Though he still feels he's in control, his flying ability is not as sharp as it was in the beginning. As a result, he finds himself above his assigned altitude. Two seven Bravo, say your altitude, please. Uh, Roger, 27 Bravo. Uh, Striving to maintain control, our pilot nevertheless is having difficulty, both in understanding the controller and in handling the aircraft. Lack of coordination due to the effects of hypoxia causes him to lift first one wing and then the other in his attempt to maintain straight and level flight. Symptomatic of hypoxia, beads of sweat form on his upper lip as he struggles to concentrate. His reflexes and his thought processes are slowing down. And again, he misses a transmission from the controller. 27 Bravo, squawk 424 what? 4242. His flight instruments show increasingly erratic control. Because of lack of oxygen, even one's personality can change. So, like approach, uh, 5427 Bravo, come in, please. Roger, 5427 Bravo, Roger. 27 Bravo, we're receiving on center frequency. Switch 124.3, please. Roger, 124.3, what we got? 
Man, fair. Three bullets a marker. Continue approach. Two seven Bravo, squawk four two zero five. Two seven Bravo, four two seven five. Negative four two zero five. Four two zero five. Misunderstanding figures, as our subject has just done, is another symptom of hypoxia, and could be dangerous for a fumbling pilot in a crowded sky. Even though our subject is a highly experienced flight instructor and is striving to perform well, hypoxia is taking its toll. 27 Bravo, uh, contact approach 118.0. He may suspect he's in trouble by this time, but he isn't certain. He's fast approaching the euphoric stage of hypoxia, where everything seems great, even though his reflexes are not functioning properly. Approach, uh, Switch to Salt Lake City frequency with instructions to begin his approach. Our pilot makes no effort to descend. Meanwhile, piloting technique has disintegrated, and he's nearly inverted on what should be his final approach path although he's never descended to the correct altitude. Other symptoms appear. Dryness of mouth. Eyes becoming heavier and more glazed. Twitching at the corners of the mouth is also symptomatic of hypoxia. Heavy smoking, fatigue, prescription or over-the-counter medicines could easily accelerate any or all of these symptoms. When told he's above glide path, he hesitates for some time. Finally, deeply ingrained training and his familiarity with his own hypoxia symptoms takes over, and he requests a missed approach, a solution few pilots would reach before becoming unconscious. Uh, a flat right turn, and localizer has not given any indication, and uh, you have radar contact reestablished. Negative. Roger, 427 Bravo. Hey, if you not have radar contact, that gets the auto execute an approach, right? That's exactly right, sir. Okay, what's my MOA or MEA along around here? 4,200. His flippant attitude reveals his state of euphoria and the fact that he may be only seconds away from total disablement and what would be a fatal accident if this were an actual flight. Perhaps the most important use of the altitude chamber is to teach pilots how to recognize their personal symptoms of hypoxia before oxygen deficiency becomes acute and debilitating. Every pilot should be sensitive to the little changes in his own physiology that indicate the onset of hypoxia and be aware of the fact that the altitude at which these symptoms appear may vary from day to day. It is for this reason that, although regulations require supplemental oxygen above 12,500 feet, those who conduct FAA's physiological training course at Oklahoma City recommend strongly that oxygen be used beginning above 10,000 feet during the daytime and above 5,000 at night. There are several good commercial units available, with prices beginning around $100. And the oxygen they use costs less than a dime an hour. Hypoxia isn't the only cause of accidents, but eight out of every ten pilot fatalities are caused by human factors, not mechanical or structural failures. And no matter how skilled the pilot, he's particularly vulnerable to the lethal dangers of hypoxia because the first symptoms are so subtle and slow in coming. So the next time you pre-flight your aircraft, pre-flight yourself, too. Remember that the oxygen supply in your body will be as critical to your safety as the fuel you're carrying in the wing. It's your ticket to rapid reaction, sound decision, and alert enjoyment of your flight. With an understanding of how far, how fast, and how high you can go, the sky is 
no limit to the safe and satisfying journey.